Welcome back everybody. Today we're talking about Castle Rock. Anybody that has watched this mind freak of a show now knows the subject matter of today's video. The Kid. This will contain spoilers of the first eight episodes, and I encourage anyone who hasn't seen the first eight episodes to go do so now. I'm going to start by breaking down some of the things that we know about The Kid and about the story as a whole, and see if we can just piece it together ourselves. Starting off, we know that he's bad news, at least for people or things around him. This is a heavily debated point, whether it's his actions or other people's actions, or he's just an observer of what's occurring and he knows it's going to occur. But right now, with what we have, and this being such a heavily debated point on Castle Rock TV subreddit, defining someone as bad after they've spent years locked in a cage in a dark room in a hole is pretty hard to do. But by whatever means he came to be evil or have these harmful abilities, he did. We can confirm this by the subtle hints in the show. The kid has a way to influence people. I don't believe it's as straightforward as he commands people to murder, and they murder, but it's like he motivates or enhances the negative feelings they get in the moment, and this leads them to acting outside of how they normally would. Dennis hates his job and resents the prison for the terrible things the guards are doing to the inmates, so the emotion builds in him until he finally takes out his gun and murders every guard in sight, only stopping when he runs into Henry, someone who isn't inherently connected to the thing that he currently hates. Next with Gordy's birthday party, he witnesses a small conversation turn sour, then finally lead to the brutal murder of the family members. This is the progression of anger, amplified by his presence. The father feels upset by the wife's actions. They disagree, then they argue, then it turns physical, and finally it ends in murder. The mental hospital is another occurrence. It happens off screen, but he causes a riot which results in multiple inmates lighting their beds on fire and escaping. Then finally, Gordon, just by looking at a picture of the kid, is affected by his reach in a way not yet revealed to us. But it's the exact same pattern. He can't even look at his own wife in a sexual way anymore, and here comes a cheat in couple, one breaking a vow of 12 years, and he lays awake by their sickening action until he does his best Dexter impersonation and murders them both later describing the event as, I don't know what came over me, I'm not a murderer. So it's exactly that. My theory is that he somehow influences and amplifies people's emotion, making them act on the feelings that they had already, instead of just keeping them concealed and acting as they normally would in that circumstance. The kid also has another ability, involving touch. It's hard to define when and how and why this works, but Dennis fist bumped him before murdering the guards, Dale Lacey touched him with his bare hand before finally killing himself, and the kid even warns Adolf here not to touch him, later to be found dead riddled with cancer. We know that Dale Lacey knew about this power as well, because when he touches the kid saying his goodbyes, questioning if what he did all those years ago was the right thing, he takes off his heavy-duty gloves to do so. The only reason he would need those gloves in that room is to protect himself from the kid. He knew that physically touching him had some kind of effect. This seems good to add as well, pointed out by a Reddit user listed here. This moth, just as it gets in proximity of the kid, dies immediately. At one point, we can see that the directors want us to know that he's toxic in some kind of way, because of this subtle biohazard sticker behind him as he gets up in some of the early episodes. Okay, so the kid is a force of destruction. He has abilities both telepathically and physically. It's also believed that he can hear the schisma, implied when he asks the question to Henry about if he can finally hear it. He could also have the same ability that Molly has. When he's standing on the building, he's hearing all the pain and suffering from the entire town as the wildfire rages on. However, I have reason to believe it's not just as straightforward as, here you go, this is your bad guy. So let's take a step back and look at the overall timeline of the story. Jackie cites that the Johnny Carrick murders are in 1929, so the murder-inducing entity, whomever or whatever it is, has been doing this for a while. Ruth was born in 1949, Matthew born in 1952, Henry 1980, and was adopted by the Deavers in 1985. Dale Lacey becomes warden in 1985 as well. The Christmas Day fire, which destroyed Cell Block B, making it possible for them to put a cage down there, happened two years later in 1987. Henry Deaver was lost in the woods in 1991. 
found 11 days later. Matthew Deaver died in 1991. The kid was also placed in the cage in 1991. If Henry was 5 when he was adopted and 11 when the incident in the woods occurred, he was with Matthew and Ruth for a total of 6 years. We can't define exactly when Matthew started hearing the voice of God, but we know he was making tapes of their trips out to the woods. Thankfully, Henry gets pissed and burns one because it dates these trips happening at least since November 23rd, 1989. A good two years of these trips taking place. I imagine as Matthew progressed wanting to find this noise and others to hear it too, that he pushed harder and harder, no longer requesting his adopted son to come along, but demanding it, forcing him to enter the woods at varying times of day and night, not concerned with his health. I imagine that this all peaked in 1991 when his congregation of woods people got together and wanted to push things further, resulting in something so harmful to Henry that he pushed it out of his memory, as the person who sexed up Gordon's wife will tell you. The human mind is expressly designed to forget much of its past suffering, as the body is designed to heal its wounds. So let's expand on the congregation of woods people. My thesis is that Matthew Deaver led a secret congregation of people in the woods to discover this noise, to worship it, even. I was surprised you didn't hold your father's service out here. This. This place was his church. Firstly, defining who was there. You knew my father? Very well. Then we have to consider Dale Lacey, telling us outright that he hears God talking to him, just the same as the voice of God. He heard it loud and with righteous fire commit the boy to the cage, and then never again hearing it, eventually causing such doubt that he gives up on his crusade. Some hear it once, and never again. Martha also hints that they were members of his congregation. We knew your father. We were members of his congregation. Warden Lacey wouldn't have confided in me. But this was his church. He'd drop Martha off on Sundays, drive out to the woods. I think he considered nature his chapel. Based on the clip showing the bandaged individuals hearing Matthew Deaver give the sermon about literal immortality, that many others could be a part of this too, maybe even a good portion of the town. I believe that after Matthew founded this congregation and whatever they were worshiping gave them instructions and particularly how to live forever. The Bible verse that we hear four times throughout the entire show is as follows. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. It's literally a Bible verse about overcoming death, about living forever, becoming immortal. Then in episode 5, Ruth states that nothing stays dead in this town. In episode 2, Henry says he's older than dad now. Ruth replied, when? Implying he could age further than he did when he died. I'm older than he was. Who? Dad. Older than he was when? Ever. This is subtle, but it also aligns. But here's the catch. It's immortality through occupation. Take a look at all the subtle pushes that Matthew is somehow a part of the kid. When he gets out of prison and goes to the hospital, they have him identify what is and what isn't a face. A subtle hint that this isn't metaphorically the face of who we're looking at. Also subtly pushed when he's leaving the prison and watches the tape about being whoever he wants to be. Moving into the less subtle and definitely more pushed upon, Ruth questions him about the information that only Matthew could know. Molly is told by Ruth she knew that she killed Matthew, but it didn't take. He's back, referring to the kid at this time. So yeah, this and plenty of other times the connection is made is either a hell of a red herring or the kid is Matthew Deaver, but not just Matthew Deaver. At various times, the kid seems to break from this stone-cold personality to being timid and afraid. When he tells Molly, I shouldn't be out here, it's either the kid believing himself to be the cause of this or Matthew as a part of something greater and he's out too soon. I lead towards the former because the facial expressions and, I mean, he looks legitimately scared or worried. When the Nazi is about to lay hands on the kid, he issues a warning that, hey, you don't want to touch me. 
It's actively wishing not to be the cause of this person's death. Same can be said for the scene in the shack, where we learn that he waited 27 years for him. He states that I rescued you from that basement. I didn't ask for any of this. It's like the kid is begging for solace, but Matthew has control of it most of the time. It's confusing, but that's my best guess. The other best guess that I have is that it's just an imitation of Matthew Deaver. Something that I cited as evidence can also be used to basically turn this entire thing around. We're shown the scene when he's being debriefed from prison and how to adapt to the real world, and he watches the scene about being whoever you want to be. Well, a case can be made that he is using his ability similar to Molly's ability and interpreting information that they would know and then posing as Matthew Deaver. But right now, I believe that more evidence aligns to him being Matthew Deaver. And again, if he is not, it is a huge red herring, and you're welcome to enjoy that or not enjoy that. <laughs> so in conclusion, like the kid states in episode 8 that he was there the night Henry goes through this traumatic event, and possibly even takes Henry's place in the cage, saving him from a worse fate. I believe Henry escapes, pushes Matthew off the cliff, Molly pulls the life support, but whatever magic they were trying to do in the woods worked, and Warden Lacey becomes the jailer, as it's spelled out over and over again on these day calendars. He'd locked the kid up in a metal cage for years for a reason that he didn't know, just trusted blindly that he was following the word of God. But here's what I believe to be the reason for that, too. Odin details that Matthew was working on a device that he never got a chance to build. What if this cage buried deep in the ground under an abandoned prison cell was that prototype? What I want to get at is what if this was meant for Henry? Because he was the one Matthew was actively trying to get to hear this sound. This deep hole locked in a cage with nothing to do would be extremely quiet incubating his ability to hear the schisma. We also know that Matthew compared his device to the schematics Noah was dictated by God, which would be how to build an ark. Well, take a listen at what Dale Lacey thought he was doing. Think of the end ark of gopher wood. So I built my ark. My dreams for six nights in a row. He told me exactly where he would stand at the quarry. I fully believe that Dale Lacey was led astray, that perhaps he was manipulated to do these ill-fated deeds. This isn't exactly as fleshed out of a theory as the others, but when Matthew was giving the death is swallowed up in victory speech, again, the literal verses about beating death, you can see the figure that looks like Dale Lacey in the back of the church shaking his head no. All in all, the kid is Matthew Deaver, and a character we'll soon meet that saves Henry from an even more hideous fate all those years ago. But overall, I want to hear what you guys have to say. Is this a valid theory? Do you think I've provided enough evidence for it? Uh, is there another theory that you subscribe to that you want people to know about? Go ahead and comment it down below. Thank you to everyone who continues to show such amazing support. If you like this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. Big thank you to my highest tier donators on Patreon. Sandra Westerberg, Vanessa Cano, Sammy Barris, Chris Cole, Robert Holtz, and John Levin. Much love, guys, and I can't wait to talk to you again soon.